In this video, FUX is going to show you my Hanfu or Chinese traditional costume collection. Hi, you're watching FNUX, where a junkie on good storytelling shares her thoughts, knowledge, and occasional weird ideas on stories and how they're told. Today's video is a bit special. It's not about any drama or any story that's going on. It is about my personal interest and collection of Chinese traditional costume, or in the Chinese term, Hanfu. Hanfu literally means the clothing of the Han ethnic group. Um, is a very general and big term these days people use to describe um, the traditional clothing of the Han Chinese people. If you know a little bit about Chinese history, you would know that currently in China, about over 90% of the entire population belongs to the Han ethnic group. Interestingly enough, the idea or the term Hanfu was not actually introduced until very recently, probably in the last 10 years. Before that, this word simply doesn't really exist in people's vocabulary. The reason being, unlike other Eastern Asian countries such as Korea or Japan, that they still today practice and wear very regularly on specific occasions their traditional costume, in Japan being kimono and in Korea being hanbok. Um, the Chinese, the mainland Chinese people don't really carry on the tradition of wearing any traditional costumes for any specific occasions anymore. If we look at Korea, for example, um, their current traditional costume really is the type of costume that people have been wearing uh, in the latest um, imperial and feudal dynasties uh, in their history. So the Korean Li or Yi dynasty that ruled Korea for over 500 years. Similarly, if you look at Japanese kimono people wear these days, it comes from the same style that people wore uh, back in the time that is the closest period to the modern Japan. Now, China has a different situation because the closest period to modern China is actually a Manchurian ruled Qing dynasty, which by a lot of Han people's um, definition is not really a Han ruling um, period and also the culture is heavily influenced by Manchurian culture so the costume people wore and also the hairstyle for example the men's very famous pigtail style is really not a Han um, ethnic thing so when people look at Han Fu um, costume of the Han they go back in time and trying to pick a period that can represent the type of clothing that Han ethnic groups have always worn but the problem is there isn't one China has a long history for example, if you count from Han Dynasty, which is the one right after Qing and um, the one that actually established most of the cultural standard and rules that Han Chinese people carried on for thousands of years, it's over 2000 years ago. And during different time periods, clothing changed very, very dramatically. Each period has its very strong identity and style, so it's really, really hard to say which one can be the representative for all the Hanfu that ever existed in Chinese history. So today, I'm just going to show you a few pieces that I have uh, collected or made over time. They are of two different dynasties, so two different base styles. One is from the Ming Dynasty, so that's the one that's closest to our modern time, the last sort of Han ruling uh, period. And then Tang Dynasty, so far back in about uh, 600s to 900s um, AD. I have a good friend coming over to help me uh, model these clothes so that you can see how they're put on to a person. Now, I don't really own any male costumes or Hanfu for obvious reasons. I hope in the future I might be able to do some videos about that, but right now, just because I don't have any piece of clothing on my hand um, that is male clothing. So this one is gonna be strictly female clothing of Ming and Tang Dynasty. And obviously, I cannot show all the styles that existed in those periods. That's just impossible. I'm just picking some very, very representative styles. Now here, a quick word about Ming Dynasty style. If you watch a lot of uh, Asian drama, you might notice that the Ming Dynasty costume is extremely close to the Korean costume. The reason actually being, during Ming Dynasty, it's also the Chongsam, um, the old Koreans, Li or Li Dynasty. 
At that time, um, the Korea was a subordinate country to uh, China, so its governing systems um, is copied from the Chinese Ming Dynasty system, and that also uh, influenced their way of dressing. If you look at their king's costume, their queen's costume, um, if you look at Chongsun Dynasty's official costumes, it's literally a very close copy from the style of the Ming Dynasty court. But of course, there's um, modifications. Very typically, Korean costume has a very strong identity as being having an extremely high waistline. So the female, both female and male, actually have their waist tied right up to their chest. And that's like the biggest difference. There are uh, other subtle differences, but you can see still um, the costumes have very similar quality. Now let's start with Min Dynasty. First, you have your undergarments, your jacket and skirt. You can wear the skirt over the jacket or under it. And it's basically worn the same way as the outer skirt and jacket. So I'm going to show that um, once she puts that on. Right now, she's putting on um, the outer skirt. You can see she's putting uh, the strip through a hole in the waistband. Now, this is a modern invention just to help preventing the bunching up of fabric around the waist. It's not really seen in any historical artifacts. And often, historically, when people wear this type of skirt, they would actually hide those two strips so you would never see them once you finish putting the clothes on. This skirt is called Ma Wei Qun or Bai Zhe Qun. It means it has a lot of folds. This is typical to Ming Dynasty skirt as they always have very distinctively and ironed out folds. If you look at Korean traditional skirt, they don't have that many folds. Right now she's putting on the jacket. It's put on the same way as the inner jacket is put on. It's always ended up with the strips tied on your right side. But first, you have to tie the inner piece at the front of your body under your left armpit to secure the inner piece of fabric. And then you tie the uh, outside piece that's under your right armpit. Usually two would do the job. For this particular jacket, it's over 2 meters long from tip of the left sleeve to the right. Now she's putting on another type of skirt that is called Ma Mian Qun. It is slightly different from Ma Wei Qun. And now you can see this design has four strips on the waistline to avoid bunching up of fabric around the waistline. The difference between Ma Mian and Ma Wei is that the front and the back of the skirt has a larger flat area with all the folds bunched up on the left and right side of the body. This is a very common jacket of Ming Dynasty called Beizi. and it comes together with a button in front of your chest. This is a modern design that's very different from the traditional design. For the buttons here, I have something on hand that I can show you. I bought the button off the internet, but it's actually based on historical, real artifacts about the buttons that people use in Min Dynasty. You have two pieces of clothing come together. You can see this. And then this is the metal button that you slip in and it ties the clothes together really nicely. So this type of button is actually more accurate to uh, Ming Dynasty's historical button uh, than the one that I've shown you in my video. For traditional Chinese costumes, it's very important to have the midline because Chinese costumes are symmetrical on the left and right instead of having a front and back piece. For example, when you look at her left side of the body, it's actually made of two pieces of fabric. One piece of fabric consists of half of the body and half of the sleeve, and it drips over your front and back. And then the other piece is the rest of your sleeve. Now she's putting on another type 
of one piece wrapping dress that's actually very commonly seen as、um, historical artifacts are. So you basically only have two strips、uh, attached to the end of the waist. The problem with this is when you put it on, as you can see,、uh, when she's tying it on her right side, on her left side, there's always this bunching up of fabric that cannot be evened out. This piece I bought off internet. It's a very lovely piece, very light fabric, beautiful color, and it's machine embroidery, but very nicely done. This is a bigger, more、uh, glamorous version of the bathes because it has a larger sleeves and just beautiful decoration. While it's extremely beautiful, wearing this and trying to do anything is extremely impractical. What I'm wearing currently is something that I made、uh, a while ago, and、um, it's based on the Ming Dynasty spades style. So very similar to the purple and red jacket that I've shown you.、Um, it has a rather generally not too large but not too small sleeve, and then the collar is flat like this. It comes to your chest level. Usually you could find two stripes、um, attached here for you to fasten it. But also more commonly in Ming Dynasty, people would actually、uh, put the metal button、uh, at this point so that you can actually close the jacket. But it can also be worn just open like this. The Tang Dynasty is a very interesting dynasty because these days, when people think back on Chinese history and thinking which period was China the strongest or most powerful, or richest, they often think it was the Tang Dynasty. That is actually not really true to history because whether you're counting population, GDP, or cultural influence, or territory, anything really that can be used、um, as a number to classify if a civilization is powerful or not, North Song Dynasty that came after、uh, the Tang Dynasty was actually the most powerful、um, ancient Chin Chinese dynasty. But I think the reason why a lot of people think Tang Dynasty is sort of the bigger, the ideal picture, is really due to its cultural bloom. And China at that time was a leader of the world culture, and at that point, it was so open, so inclusive, to the point that foreigners came to China, and it's possible for foreigners to hold important government official positions, and really work for the Chinese emperor as a foreigner. Not as ambassadors, not as、um, you know, you gain sort of your Chinese identity and become Chinese citizens. No, you remain your foreign citizen, and you can still work for the government. That is just incredible in human history, and it's not even practiced today. So that just shows you how open China was back then, and it also shows up in the aesthetic styles of Tang, which is often considered to be the most beautiful and the most luxurious look that Chinese history has ever produced. So I think that's why、um, Tang Dynasty is often considered to be the most successful ancient dynasties, which is not actually technically true.、Um, Tang Dynasty costumes, if you look at ancient paintings, are super thin. They use extremely, extremely thin, silky material, and have a very sort of luxurious way of using texture, colors, patterns, and just sheer amount of fabric that you can put on a person's body. This piece of Tang Dynasty costume I bought off internet. I really love the way it comes together. The color, the texture, just gives you a very accurate kind of feeling of Tang Dynasty costume. First, you have a very simple under jacket, and then you need to step into this dress. This dress is made up, or the skirt is made up with two pieces. You have to first tie the back piece to the front of your chest, and then the front piece. Covering that piece and then loop it around you and then tie it front. This type of skirt is not exactly、um, accurate to history because, frankly, nobody really knows how Tang Dynasty people dress、um, when they wear this high waist skirt because historical artifacts don't exist. It's over a thousand years, so it could not really be recovered. And from paintings, you can't really tell how people put it together. This type of dress is actually designed based on a type of Japanese costume that has this two-piece way of wearing it. But exactly what happened in Tang Dynasty, nobody really knows these days. 
Now you can see she is wrapping the strips to secure it. This way it's actually more secure than having just simple ribbon in front of your chest. This type of skirt is really easy to come down accidentally. So you need to make sure it's very, very tight. The way she does it is she creates two loops, which is very similar to how paintings have shown Tang Dynasty people wear uh, this type of high-waisted skirt. I love this fabric's feeling, but it's really hard to walk in this because it's full floor length. Now you can often drip this long piece of fabric over you. It's over three meters long and it's very typical of Tang Dynasty. Adds a lot of decorative quality to the dress. So that's the end of this video. Have you enjoyed it? Um, do you think it is interesting and how people perceive clothes in history uh, that is different really from the current time and if you had a chance would you be happy to wear something like this personally to me i wouldn't really wear hanfu especially very ceremonial and very uh, beautiful ones um, for daily work and life just because it's really inconvenient when you have a large sleeve it gets caught in everything in the doorknob um, by your desk and you knock over things and it gets dirty and you cannot even move uh, very easily so I'm actually really appreciative of modern clothing that allows people to actually move and be comfortable in their body but it doesn't mean that hanfu is uncomfortable, it just needs a lot of adjusting especially when you put it on, you have to actually change how you move um, it really gives you a different perspective of how clothing can shape people's life Thank you for watching Avenue X, I'll see you in my next video Meanwhile, live long and happy cosplaying <laughs>